right, let's go ahead and uh, get, get started. Uh, thank you everyone for, for coming, being here. It is my, my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Melanie Barboni. Uh, Melanie's visiting us from ASU. Uh, Melanie's originally from Lausanne, Switzerland, where she did her undergrad and her PhD. Um, after uh, Lausanne, she moved to the States, where she did a postdoc uh, at Princeton University, where she was Blair uh, Shiny uh, for uh, three years. And then she moved to uh, UCLA, uh, where she did a postdoc for a couple of years uh, before joining uh, ASU in, in 2018. If I'm um, so, Melanie. Uh, you know, if you haven't read some of Melanie's papers, I, I highly recommend you to, because they're really cool, new, and insightful. She's a, she's a great geochemist to think about geochronologies and time filters for processes and combining geochemistry, geostenometry, diffusion, and thermal modeling in, in ways that are really, really powerful. Uh, Melanie's really interested in magnetic systems, and uh, that's done a lot of her, you know, her PhD work and kind of early postdoc work was mostly focused on magnetic systems, time scales of magnetic systems, heat pumps, things like that. And uh, after maybe when you moved to UCLA, yeah. when kind of interest shifted over to the moon. And she started looking at lunar zircons and also zircons from other planetary bodies. So she's been studying zircons from a lot of places other than Earth as well to extract you know, time scales and processes. And uh, today she's going to talk about some of that research and tell us about how we use Lunar zircons to learn about lunar effects. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Melanie's also very knowledgeable about curves. Uh, so you want to know more about her after and I decided that I, I heard that one of her birds is going to make an appearance yeah. during the talk, which I'm looking forward to. Yeah, can we just talk about birds? <laughs> <laughs> you can skip the moon. Let's skip the moon. <laughs> right, so I'm, uh, with that, I'll let you be on the top. <laughs> Well, it's, a, it's very nice to be in the University of Arizona. So first of all, uh, I haven't been here like a major, and I need to tell you the story, and you have to tell me if you, you guys have a name for us. But when I told my undergrad yesterday, I was telling him to bring a toast, they looked at me like shocked, and they said, we are going to dirty tea. <laughs> okay. So I was shocked, apparently you guys are dirty tea. So how do you call the name? <laughs> Sleepy tea, I don't know. <laughs> okay. You don't want to know. I was going to ASU, the third best public university in Arizona. It's, it's, it's the first. <laughs> <laughs> and the second one is not a university. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have been here to transmit that to my undergrad. And by the way, this one is very nice. I don't understand where this one is from. Anyway, so whatever. <laughs> So today we are going to be looking at lost lunar magma. So maybe you didn't know that we lost lunar magma, but actually we did. And right now you are wondering why you are going to spend 25 minutes uh, like hearing you talk about lunar magma, especially the old lunar magma. And um, it's working now. That's always fun. It's not working now. Let me let me quick and here. Like on the ball. Like, here, give it a try. Yeah, there you go. And then try. Okay. Yeah, it should work. Okay, so why do we care about moon magma? Okay, so you have heard that the moon is made out of cheese, right? Uh, it's a, a paradigm that is now totally accepted. Uh, melted cheese, obviously, is very important for me because uh, and it's not working again. Not cheese. Maybe I'll just stay here. And uh, melted cheese is very important to me because, well, I am from Switzerland, so obviously. We want to understand the composition of cheese in order to know how good the fondue is going to be. But it looks like NASA actually already answered my question because a while ago they published this picture with that date here. And this is the comments that they made on that picture, which is basically the moon is made out of green cheese. Okay, I never heard <laughs> of green cheese before. And apparently there is an expiration date and it expired on April 1st. Uh, uh, 2002, so it's an old expired green cheese. So apparently NASA already solved all of my kind of problems. However, I'm going to ask you to make a leap of faith with me and just think that the moon is actually not made out of cheese for the next like, uh, you know, 45 minutes and assume that it's actually made of rock. So why do we care about understanding the old magma on the moon? Well, to understand that, let's take a step back and see how the moon formed. Like most of the rocky planets, the moon was accreted very hot, and most of its surface 
was covered with a magma ocean, what we call the magma ocean. When that magma ocean crystallized, this is what we believe happened on the moon. This is the magma ocean and it's dark. We don't really know how the core was looking like, but you had a magma ocean that starts cooling down. By cooling down, we had high temperature minerals that were dense that crystallized first, the honeybee and the pyroxene. They sink, they form the mantle of the moon. Then we have heavy crystallization of major plates that were very light and they floated and basically they form the crust of the moon. And at the very end of the moon formation, the residual now, the five last percent of that inner magma ocean was kind of squeezed in between the mantle and the crust. And that layer is important because it's very enriched in incompatible elements that couldn't enter in any of the other mineral. And it's why it's called the creep layer that stands for potassium, reverse element, and phosphorus, all incompatible elements. So this is how the moon forms. And we know that then the moon gets banged by multiple impacts. So we excavated part of the moon, we melted the mantle, and we filled those craters with basalt. And this is the black area, the mare, that we are looking at the moon every day. So what I just described is something that we call planetary differentiation. So every planet, every rocky planet that formed, they must have followed something like that in order to form their layers. And it's very important for us to understand planetary differentiation because, well, we would like to understand how something like that came to be, right? Uh, on Earth, how did it form? Unfortunately, if you go on Earth and you try to look for example of planetary differentiation on Earth, there is a little problem called plate tectonics. And this plate tectonic has been erasing most of the earliest events recorded by the Earth. And in that regard, the neighbor, the moon, could be our best hope to find this trace of differentiation and understand how a magma ocean actually is going to crystallize. So by studying the moon, we care about the old magma on the moon because it could interact on planetary differentiation, how we are actually building planets. There is another reason why we care about the moon magmas, the old one. The solar system actually was shaped by a lot of impact. You know that, right? You have seen many evidence of impact just looking at the moon. The moon itself, we believe, was actually uh, made by an impact from the proto-Earth with a planet that we call Theia that was roughly the size of Mars. And I have a little video of uh, how that impact could maybe uh, composition, when those main impacts appear, basically, 
we can understand the dynamic early in the solar system. And remember, the main planet building and transformation mechanism occurs through early impacts in the solar system. And the moon recorded all these impacts, while the Earth did not record it. Well, maybe they did, but it's very hard to actually get that kind of record of that on the Earth. So this is also playing a big role for the habitability, the habitability of the early Earth. And when could we expect to have life appearing? Why? Well, this is the biggest impact that we have recorded on the moon, South Pole Apex, okay? Size, uh, okay, a good chunk of the United States. Uh, so something like that banged into the moon about 4.3 billion years ago. So the moon is small, and then you have this very shiny Earth next to it. The odd for something that being also hitting the Earth at well, that time is pretty big. And therefore, if we understand when those big impacts occur on the moon, if we can decipher their magma that form the size of those impacts, we can then go to the record of the Earth and see if we see evidence of this impact that could have changed very drastically the history of the Earth. So I hope I have convinced you that we should care about the moon magmas, the early one. And I'm saying magmas, plural, because we actually have two magmatic histories on the moon. We have one that records the planetary dislocation, primary dislocation of the moon. And we have one that is impact related that will infer us on basically the evolution early on in the solar system. And we can link that to what was happening on Earth at that time as well. So did I convince you that the moon actually is great? Uh, yeah. So the moon is occurring in all. So nature is, has been so good with us. All we have to do is to find some lunar sample. And we have all the question of the universe solved, right? Well, it's when nature, as you know, it likes to throw us some curve ball. And I'm very proud of me because like two years ago, I wouldn't have been able to make a baseball analogy. Now I can. <laughs> yeah, I've been like growing that much. So what is the careful in uh, the, the lunar rocks? Well, the old lunar rocks, they are looking like that. And they have been delivered to us in two different ways. Some of them actually fell out of the sky very nicely. The lunar meteorite, that's this one. And actually we went on the moon and we were able to sample some of the moon rock. And this is, for example, uh, a sample from Apollo 16 mission. And when we look at them, we realize that they are what geologists call a brescia. What is a brescia? So I don't know if you guys are into patchwork. My mom, she is. So she takes fabrics of like, uh, you know, tissue fabric from all over the world with different age and history. And she puts everything together into one piece of art. Well, the brescia on the moon, they are that. They are pieces of rocks from a very large area on the moon with different histories and different composition, and they are stuck together within one rock. So how now can we start understanding what is the history of that rock if that rock has 20 histories and the history probably has been like messed up with impacts as well. So as an analogy for you to understand why this is actually a big problem, I found this idea. So let's say you take a movie and you compress all the frame of your movie into one single frame, and then you try to guess what the movie is, okay? I did that with one movie that I took uh, of something, you'll see. So now this is what I got, and I'm like, okay, so what's the story? You are going to tell me, oh, it's a Halloween movie. We have like a six eyes monster who is attacking like a zombie kind of mutant monster. And then you say, yeah, well, is that the story? We need to actually take all the frame of the movie and put them in the right chronological order. And the key word here is time. We have to put all these frames in the correct sequence. And when we do that, oh, it's not a Halloween movie. It's one of my hummingbirds. Uh, mom, her name is Quick. I have named her actually. She, she lives at UCLA. And she's feeding two of her babies, Sardis and Little Zircon, was getting a little bit impatient there. So, Yes, I named one of my hummingbirds Zircon. And there is a reason for that. Because remember, we need to find a tool that connects time with chemistry in order to understand the movie on the moon. And that tool is the magical mineral that I love so much, Zircon. So Zircon is a silicate of zirconium. 
It's an accessory mineral that crystallizes on Earth, usually in intermediate superficial magma. And this is, by the way, not how they look like on the moon. This is actually zircon from Earth. I didn't dare showing you the zircon from the moon because they're kind of ugly. But on Earth, they look very, very pretty like that. But what is magical in zircon is once they are very, very resistant. People say diamonds are forever. I disagree. Zircon are forever. Yeah. They are very, very resistant <laughs> and they could even resist impacts. If they don't, we actually have clinical traces that tells us that they have been affected by some uh, resisting event of impact. And they still circulate wealth of chemical tracer inside the structure that we can use to understand magmatic system. So this is a periodic table of the elements that has been color coded to represent what is going inside zircon. So in blue, this is the building block of zircon, zirconium, silicon, and oxygen. And in this shade of yellow to red, we have like the uh, trace elements and the, the darker shade we have, the more we find in the zircon. So the geochemists in the room, they see right away that the zircon take the reverse element, which has very nice chemical tracer. We are not going to talk about them today, but I would like to like point you to a couple of trace elements that we are going to use. The first one that makes zircon so special is uranium. And this is because uranium is actually a radioactive isotope. As you know, it's not stable. It will decay into a daughter, in this case, a daughter of lead. And actually, there is two isotopes of uranium, 238 and 235, that will decay into two different daughters, 236 lead and 207 lead. The zircon, when it crystallizes, takes those two isotopes of uranium, but doesn't take any of the isotopes of lead, which means that you have 100 percent uranium. And through time, this uranium is going to transform into lead. And at any time, when you measure the ratio of uranium to lead, you know when the zircon forms. And this is the best chronometers. And I think everybody in the room that know uranium lead won't agree, won't argue with me that this is the number one chronometers that we can use. The reason for that, not only because zircon is so resistant and uranium lead is a good chronometer, it's because of the dual clock that we have. We have two clocks working in the system. And this is very helpful because basically that gives us two different edges. And when those edges agree, we know our zircon remain untouched, pristine, and we can trust the edges. When those edges disagree, we know that our zircon become leaky when affected, for example, by impact, and that every other chemical trace that we look at should also be taken with some care. And this is the only chronometers that allow you to basically double check the quality of your data in one glance. So the question is, do we find zircon on the moon? If you have been like, paying attention, I just told you that zircon on Earth, they crystallize in intermediate to felsic magma. And probably most of you know that the moon is not exactly felsic in composition. Actually, the only place in the thinner magma ocean that you can have zircon is in the creek layer because this is where you reach enough zirconium content to actually be able to saturate the zircon. And we find lots of zircon on the moon, and they mostly, we believe, originally came from the creep layer. So during this talk, I'm going to look at a collection of Apollo zircon, and we are going to see what we can do to decipher the primary and secondary magnetic history of the early moon, okay? So let's have a look at our field area first. And this is the only field picture I have for the talk. So this is my field area here. Okay, so I landed over there. This is my spaceship here on my assembly ground. Yeah. And this is me, obviously, when I was selecting my sample. <laughs> and you know, I love to do my show work myself, but well, in that case, it wasn't really possible. So obviously, this was the commander of Apollo 14, Commander Collins. Who was like the sampling my sample actually we came from here if you want to know and it was in 1971 and this time here yeah this time this is me and i'm looking like an idiot because that was the first time i was holding a piece of the moon in my hand and let's face it it's a i still haven't recovered from the feeling even if i touch them quite often now it's just like the best feeling in the world i mean i'm into star trek that thing was brought back from another planet in a spaceship Okay, how cool is that? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty cool. Okay, let's have a look at this amazing time capsule that is zircon. So this is how they look like on the moon. This is actually now 
you know, there comes the psychology method to make of those guys are very boring looking. And what makes them so precious is they have a very high flow of temperature for most elements, which means that they have very little diffusion of elements out of their crystal after they crystallize and they retain the chemical information very well. And they also preserve, as we have seen, both ages and chemical information. So this is a compilation of about 300 something, 400, yeah, 300 something uh, lunar zircon ages. This is land like ages in a billion of years. And we see that most of the lunar zircon, they range between 4.4 to 3.9 billion years. Okay, it's old. So the zircon actually recorded about 500 million years of the moon history. And even better than that, 500 million years very early in the moon history, right in the time that we want to understand these two magma composition I was telling you about. If we look at them in context with their rocks, it's very hard to do because most of the time they are in Brescia and we don't have the context with the whole track, but every now and then we have been able to see it in certain things section. We see that we have some zircon that are interstitial, they grow in between different phases. And this is very specific of zircon crystallizing late in the residual mass, like in a crypt, when they have a very less to crystallize. And they can't quite you see, like accommodate their shape to the stay that is remaining in the rock. We also have zircon that has seen better days. And so it expressed that zircon on the moon have experienced some of the shock and the impact that the moon has been experiencing. But actually, we don't have that many of like half cook transformed zircon on the moon. We have either those ones that are mostly primary, or we have perfectly magmatic looking zircon that are not shock affected, but are much younger than the age of the moon. If you look, you know, the moon formed around 4.5 here, and there is no way that all this grain could have crystallized from the lunar magma ocean because the lunar magma ocean cannot survive that long, which means that a lot of those grains have to be crystallizing from new magma. And those new magma have an impact magma I was telling you about. So we have actually the zircon recording the two things that we need. The primary magmatic history of the moon, the one that crystallized in the creep layer, and the one that also crystallized in the different impact heavens uh, occurring on the moon. How can we relate the magma composition of what was a creep magma and what was an impact magma now we need to look inside the other chemical elements within the zirka. So for that, uh, some colleagues and mine, we have been looking at 96 zircon coming from Apollo 14. This is an example of the zircon into a CL image in back severed image community. So you see why I didn't put picture before. They are not very nice looking, but they are very old. So give them some flag, okay? They are like 4 point something billion years old. Uh, and this is the ages we got of this 96 zircon. This is then that is 10 million of years. Our ages are in red and the gray are just for comparison, the distribution of every zircon data. And we see that they're recording mostly the full, the full spectrum with those guys are just missing some of the oldest ones because those are very rare. So we are going to recording for about 4.35 billion to 3.9 billion years. What can we look inside the zircon to decipher the magmas? Uh, that those zircon were crystallizing from. Remember, we don't know those magmas because everything is a Brescia. We don't know what those magmas are looking like. But the zircon, they re actually recorded who their parents were. And this is the elements we are going to look at today. So I'm going to leave this one for the end. We are going to quickly look at this one and then those two. First, titanium. So you see, it's very shaded. Like not a lot of titanium goes inside the zircon, but enough goes. Uh, you have a question? Sorry. The last slide. The compiled zircon, are they, are they from a lot of different areas? Yeah, so most of the compiled zircon, those, those actually, they are all from Apollo 14. But the, the one I showed before, they were also Apollo 15 and Apollo 17. That's the three sites where most of the zircon have been found because this, this is where most of the creep was actually out of the surface when this was sampled. But this gray area, we just spotted only the Apollo 14 sample here. But to be fair, there is not distinction between the different sites. The zircon seems to all be sampling the same range. I'm, I'm currently working on Apollo 15 and 17 uh, zircon in some section, and 
I cannot really tell the difference. Yeah. So let's have a look at titanium. So as I say, titanium, it will enter the structure of the zircon in a way that is proportional to the magma temperature. So that gives us the thermometer. And the way that works, uh, this is the calibration that we are using. And basically, if we know how many ppm zirconium we have, we see that if we know, if we have some information on the activity of silicon and titanium, this is what actually determines the substitution of titanium inside the zircon, then we can derive the crystallization temperature. And on the moon, we are able to estimate those parameters. So we are able to get apparent crystallization temperature of the magma from this lost zircon. That's pretty important, and I'm going to show some titanium temperature later in the talk. Let's have a look now at thorium and uranium. And I'm going to say, yeah, you already talked about uranium. Okay, that's the super nice chronometers that you are telling us about. And you know the funny thing is, people just obsess about uranium, about the chronometer, but they forgot that uranium is also like a very useful chemical tracer. The raw concentration of uranium and its close friend thorium are actually very nice to track histories of magma. Why is that? Well, they are incompatible elements and they are going to be enriched in residual melt. But if you are looking to find zircon that are primary coming from the Lima magma ocean differentiation, you are going to like. Um, you know, track their type origin, and you should have uranium and thorium highly enriched in those zircons because uranium and thorium will be highly enriched in this incompatible rich layer. So you can actually use it not only as a chronometer, but also as a tracer of the origin of your magma. Another way that we care about them is uranium and thorium, they are the two big player as heat releasing elements in a magma, okay? They, they are radioactive decay is pretty active and it's going to raise the temperature of the magma. And raising the temperature of the magma is going to change the way the lunar crust could cool down, how long you can have magma. If you have an impact that creates new magma, how long those impact magma are going to be able to differentiate and act. So we want to know if the distribution of those elements change towards the magmatic history of the moon. And this is why we are going to measure them. And to my knowledge, we are the very first one to actually measure the raw concentration of them and not just kind of use uranium as a chronometer. I don't know why, honestly, it's just kind of obvious to me, but people I think just didn't think about it. So we measure like thermal and uranium for all of our circuits. So this is what we have found. This is again the age in millions of years, 4.4, 2.9. This is uranium concentration and thorium concentration. It's initial because we have calculated like the amount of uranium before all the decay happened, okay? We had like 4.4 billion years of decay happening that lower uranium concentration, but we just like calculated of what this concentration was at the time of the zircon crystallization. And what we see is pretty interesting. It seems 4.2 billion years. And before that, there is a huge variety of uranium and thorium concentration in our zircon. And this variability completely disappeared at the 4.2, where both the thorium and the uranium are actually very flat. So there is two ways you can do that. The first one, that is the obvious one, is the magmas will be flat. And that's something that we want to know, right? Another one, the geochemists in the room are going to tell me, it could be some other uranium and thorium and other mineral that are just next to your zircon and just competing a little bit, and that makes some variation. However, this is not the case, because when you actually ratio the two elements, you have a flat signal, which means that this is not a contamination of one phase it's sometimes that contaminates something else. It is actually a real enrichment thorium and uranium that relates to the magma composition on the moon. So what have we learned here? Well, after 4.2 billion years, uh, we have a very homogeneous magmas recorded by the zircon. Before that, we have variable magma composition. We have different magma composition early on, and then this diversity disappears. So that's all good. I have been proving that case of zircon can pick up different magmas that we didn't even know existed before. But it's not telling me much because you are going to tell me uranium and sodium, you are cute, but they are trace elements. I mean, when you are talking about discovering new magma, I won't measure them and give me the beef. 
Okay, when you describe a magma, you don't describe the uranium and thorium content, you describe what is silicon, the aluminum, and all these gas, correct? What do I mean by that? What we want to know is the famous major element, spectrology 101. This is the major element. This is how they look like in different work on Earth. And until recently, the zircon was completely helpless to help us with that. Basically, the only thing the zircon was able to tell us was, well, on Earth, they saturate only in intermediate felted melt, which means the magma probably is quite felted to differentiate zircon. Also, we are discussing that before. We don't even know if this is true on the moon or not. So until then, that was it. So useless for major elements. And it is until my friend, Dustin Trail, made a very interesting discovery. He was messing around on the ion probe and he kept finding some signal on the aluminum mass when he was looking at the zircon. And he went into a very painstakingly like process to make sure it wasn't contamination. And he was able to show that aluminum actually was particularly inside the structure of zircon. And that is very important because aluminum is a major element. And we can now, if we can relate this aluminum in zircon to the current magma, we have a way, way to prove the major composition of magma that we don't know exists anymore. So the question, like the 1,000 box question is like, yeah, does how many aluminum enter the zircon is proportional to how many aluminum we have in the current magma? So Dustin, what he did, he took um, 19 different granites on Earth, and in these different granites, he extracted 800 zircon, and for each, he measured the aluminum content in the zircon, and he compared it to the ASI of the current granite that he was measuring. So as a reminder, the ASI is the aluminum content divided by calcium and the alkali. So the ASI not only infer you on aluminum, but also on three other very important major elements. And what he found is the more they are luminous, the more aluminum, the higher the ASI is in a magma, the more aluminum is in the zircon. So the way zircon substitute aluminum is proportional, if you like, to the rock uh, major composition, ASI composition. So Dustin happened to be an experimental petrologist. So he said, hey, let's make a collaboration out of it. You know, let's do some experiment. So what he did, he picked up different uh, starting composition with different ASI, and he grew zircons experimentally out of those different experimental runs, and he measures the aluminum in those zircons, and he did that at different temperature, and he proved through this experiment that not only zircon, aluminum and zircon were entering in a way that was proportional, you can see very nicely here, to the ASI of the current magma, but also that we have a temperature dependence, like right? the higher the magma is, the more of the substitution will happen. And from this experimental calibration, he was able to get that expression where if you can measure how many aluminum you have in your zircon and you have an estimation of the temperature, which you can get the high in your zircon, you can derive some compositional information on your parent's magma. Yes. So these maps that Dustin has used, so like in terms of, like, are they like rather big day to day? Uh, they were all mostly granitic. They were like um diuretic to granitic mostly. Okay. Yeah, because you know the assumption was zircon crystallized. That's yeah. why on the moon, the ones we are using are more like moon like. I'm going to come to that point yeah. in a minute. Yeah, those were for granite, right? From Earth terrestrial. And he was having jackals in his mind. So they are mostly a uh, granitic composition. Yeah. So that's amazing, right? Because now we actually have a way to probe the composition of the parent magma of the zircon that have been all placed in their own spot. So I was at UCLA doing my uh, postdoc at that time, already like with signal between our zircon and uh, Dustin was doing the sabbatical where he presented that. And I remember I stopped jumping around at the back of the room. And I went to him and I said, hey, do you want to like test that on you know zircon? Because I don't know the parental composition of my zircon. I have some cool trace elements, but honestly, it's just missing something. So it's like, yeah, sure. So we went on the ion probe and we measured this 96 zircon I had sitting around. And this is what we have been obtaining. So this is the 80 million of years. This is the aluminum in zircon. This is the two session we did for aluminum. And we see that we have 
some variability in aluminum. And sometimes you know there are some that are very low in aluminum, and some that are actually fairly high in comparison. So just looking at that, we know we have different magma composition that are recorded from the zircon. They do not all crystallize from a creep layer, clearly. We have more than that going on. However, remember, it's actually a good idea to look at this, um, this data in uh, looking at the temperature as well, because the substitution is actually dependent on the temperature as well. So this is why we like to express it with here the temperature that we got from the titanium in zircon, and this is in Celsius, and here we have the aluminum PPM, so I guess the color of the field, this color doesn't give you clear on the next slide, but I have color coded my zircon with in blue the ones that are younger than 4 billion, and in red uh, that's the ones that are older than 4 billion. And what we see is the ones that are uh, you know, younger than 4 billion, they tend to have less clusters slightly, but most of them cluster at low aluminum, while the ones that are older than 4 billion. They are both having low and high aluminum, so more diversity in this over four billion year zircon. So now, you know, it will be so, so tempting to calculate an ASI using Dustin calibration. There is a tiny bit of a problem here. Dustin did his calibration for terrestrial magma. Do you know what is the big difference between moon magma and earth magma? Can you really want to tell the magic word? Something we have plenty on Earth, but they don't have a lot on the moon. Exactly, the water. And because the substitution actually involves hydrogen, for all we know, the water could actually change its calibration quite a lot. So, oh, hey, drama, crap. Good news. So, now that will become interesting, and they recently gave us a bunch of money to redo the experiment for lunar composition, which we are currently doing. We are actually having most of the run done. We're still missing a couple. And we are going to have a calibration very soon. But until then, we cannot derive the ASI. But don't disappear. No, don't be sad because we can still do something about it. Mm -hmm. And for that, I am going to just go a tiny bit inside thermodynamics. And I'm sorry. Okay, this is just that one. So basically, we are the ASI is an expression of the enrichment of aluminum inside. The magma in zircon, it relates to the aluminum, but also the silicon and the hydrogen, because aluminum and hydrogen combine to replace one the silicon inside the zircon. So one silicon of the zircon gets out, and we have one aluminum and one hydrogen that is displaced. Knowing that, then we know that how many aluminum is going to like the this ASI will be a, a, um, an estimation of. The melt activity of aluminum, which is basically how enriched in aluminum you are, and also taking into account the contribution of the substitution, the activity of water that fixed the hydrogens, and the activity of silicon that fixed uh, aside forces. Okay, so on the moon, if you can estimate that and that, and actually you can, then the beta real parameters will only represent how enriched in aluminum your magma is. So we can calculate this beta real parameters until we have basically the real thing, which is the ASI. So you can think of beta real as an apparent ASI, okay? Once we have the right calibration, the thermodynamics which is expressed here could be solved, and this value are going to become a real ASI. So when we do so, we are calculating that the higher the beta real, the more aluminum enrichment you have, and so on. You can still use it this way. So this is the same diagram as before, concentration of aluminum, apparent temperature. This is our zircon that I have been showing you before. And here we have calculated those beta real value. And that basically, if the calibration on Earth work for the moon, that will be the ASI. So if the calibration on Earth work, that will be an ASI of 1.1, which is pure aluminum, steel with aluminum can last like pretty low in aluminum. What do we see from those data? Here I have actually separated the data by age grid. So here we have zircon older than 4.2 billion, and we have clearly at least maybe more, but we don't have enough zircon to tell that. But we have at least two distinct aluminum families. So we have at least two distinct, one enriched in aluminum and one pretty low in aluminum. When you get towards the younger zircon, it's especially obvious in the 3.9 billion zircon here, 
this population of high aluminum, potentially peraluminous, we still need to have a simulation, but potentially disappear, and this heterogeneity completely disappear to have only one kind of aluminum composition. So does it sound familiar? Like heterogeneity in magmas, like before 4.2, this heterogeneity completely disappear after 4.2. The uranium and the thorium were telling us the same, but here we actually have trace elements and major elements data. So let me put that back inside our history of understanding the magmas on the moon, primary versus secondary magma. Okay, so that will be the primary moon with a concept to be very called the impact affected moon. How do we find creek zircon? Do we have any of them? Does any of the zircon we have identified preserve the creep signature? Oh, yes. Basically, what do we expect in a creep zircon to have lots of thorium and uranium and also low aluminum? Why is that? Because once the creep form, all the aluminum will have been extracted to form the crust of the moon. So any zircon crystallized here will have low aluminum. Do we have a family of zircon with low aluminum and high uranium thorium? Yes, we have. And those are actually one of the pre 4.2 billion years as uh, we believe those are actually preserving the differentiation of the moon. Studying those zircon will tell us information about how the last residual amount of the magma ocean is looking. But we have so much more. Let's have a look at what impact things we have. So we have also zircon that are quite old, and there are most of them are about 4.3 billion years. And they have very high alumina and pretty low uranium and thorium. Okay, where what layer on the moon is holding all the alumina? The crust. The crust cannot separate zircon, remember, only crypt can. So, in order to have zircon with that much alumina, we need a big impact that brings out part of the crust and mix it to some crypt components. And actually, we can link that with uh, a very active impact area on the moon at 4.3 billion years. People assume for a while it was only single impact, actually, it's ongoing work. Don't say to anyone, but we can prove it was multiple big impacts very close by. And we have, can actually look at both high precision dating and mutation action that show us reflective of impact. And we know that that is beyond the only before impact magma. But we also know what they have been melting and what kind of magma we are having on the moon at that time. What about the boring guys? Remember these young guys that were having the same aluminum, the same uranium, and the same thorium? Actually, they are not boring. In order to have, remember those zircon, they are coming from a very wide area, right? They have been put together in Brescia, but they are gathering a very large area. For them to record all the same things, it must have been a very big impact because it means that the magma that was produced was large enough that a lot of zircon circulated out of it and then when impact the field they were put in Russia, those zircon all ended up in one mass. Do we know a very large impact of during at 3.9? So yeah, we do. That's when we actually found the mare. So we believe that when we found the mare, we not only found some basalt, but we also found some other kind of magmas that crystallized zircon and had a very specific uh, composition that we could start identifying. Okay, so I just want to tease a little bit of some of my most recent work. It's not on the moon. So the moon is great. We can understand very, very different solutions of impact. There is a little bit of a problem with the moon, okay? The moon is what I call recording model uh, model like differentiation processes. Why is that the case? Well, this happens at some point in time, and basically, we are looking at events and planetary differentiation at 4.6 billion years old. You're going to tell me, hey, it's super freaking old. Yeah, but the solar system actually is 4.567. And when you look at the Earth Moon system, huh, you're missing 60 million years. That hope tells you that differentiation didn't change. I'll tell you that, you know, what the impact that occurred before was supported by the Earth and the Moon would have shaped the solar system even more. Then we have some little tools that we go back in time and actually understand how they form. And this is what we call the planetesimals. Basically, the planetesimals, they are the small 
very early accreted small planets in the solar system. And in the solar region, of more than 50 miles that form the rocky planet Lenoa. And if we want to understand how differentiation has been evolving through the history of the solar system, we also need to go to those gaps. So do we have a little planet that differentiated very early in the solar system? Yes, we do. We have like way before Vesta, which is like this guy here. It's actually formed less than one million years after the start of the solar system. This is the oldest fully differentiated planet that we know. We have the core, we have the mantle, and we have the crust. So just we know what I'm talking about. This is Vesta in the asteroid belt. It still exists today. And this is exactly the size of Switzerland, my home country, if you are curious. So we have about 900 samples that we know are coming from the sun. And those were the ones that we call overnight to Christ and Diogenes, ancient data. And this is giving us the very first glimpse into the very first differentiated planet that we know of in our solar system. So quickly, this is a Vesta geology. Okay, it has an apple crust that is mostly basaltic. It also has a mantle that has been sampled uh, with this majority to diogenite. And Vesta had a very rough history. So we have a primary differentiation history. And like the moon, what do we have? An impact related history that created some new generation of meteorites that show these different impacts sampling different area of Vesta. Okay, two histories. Does it look similar to the moon? Yes, Vesta and the moon, first of all, their composition is very similar. Both are very metric. Yeah. But they also share exactly the same history, but 60 million years apart. So while the moon records modern process, Vesta records older process and the previous impact. And if we can actually compare the two records, we can learn a lot about how planetary differentiation and all the impact history was happening in the solar system. Okay, shortly, are HDS meteorites showing as curved balls? Yes, they are. 85% of Vesta sample, they are brushes. This one has three different mythology. Guess what? Most of the geographical work has been made from the rock, which means that all the ages are wrong and all the chemical information are mixed up. Who is the savior? I mean, you can tell me who is going to say us? Yes, exactly, Draken. We find Draken in HDS. For a very long time, people were saying no. Then they were saying they are like too small, I don't bother with them. Then they are too small, I cannot do anything with them. Then a bunch of people find some bigger one and make one or two chemical measurements. And after that, they just decided it was not worth wasting their time with them. I entered and I disagreed because we have much better technique right now and I'm also kind of like the born and persistent. So I launched a master's student to collect uh, different uh, HDs meteorites from all the families. And I said, look for zircon. This is the 19th sample we have found. And we found zircon in every single one of them. We found zircon in Eucrite. So this is people that have been finding zircon in Eucrite before, but never as much. So that was good. By the way, we found 63 zircon in every HDs family. And for the very first time, we found zircon in Howardite and Diogen. So this is like about two order of magnitude more zircon than ever documented in HED. And I could make a whole talk about what we are like uh, honey about the zircon, but I'm just going to tease you on that last slide, basically. Do we have a dual history recorded by the HED zircon? Yes. We have some beautiful twisting zircon in the unpreciated sample in the diogenite that are exactly like we would expect in the residual melt of a magma ocean. By the way, they have a crisp image here, like scissors. Looks like they were a crisp layer on Vesta as well. Shh, need to publish that here. Anyway, that's pretty fun, right? It's a, maybe it's actually a feature of differentiation to deflect this incompatible element layer. We also have actually twisting zircon in zircon that's a very deep to shock. There is no shock valve here, and they are just a tiny bit fractured. So we have zircon that's still resistant, that are still twisting and resistant to shock. Next to that, well, we have guys that didn't enjoy their life too much. We have in the highest shock sample we have, we still have tons of shock now. Here it's very coarse, it's like more fine grain. And we have zircon that are totally misorientated or even more like popcorn looking. That means that those guys have been living through hell 
And by the way, we do track because we have both the primary and the secondary history of BESTA recorded here. So this is everything we are doing with those Zircon. And in yellow, this is everything we have done so far. So you see everything you can use in the Zircon. It's pretty crazy. You have to invite me for a talk in a year time or so to hear about that. But right now, I'm just going to leave you with this picture, which is the sequence I took from my backyard during the months, all the phases of the moon from new moon to new moon, so it's a full moon. And my colleagues laugh because they say, only in Arizona do you have a month of clear sky to do that crazy project. <laughs> and they are right. Uh, and I'm super happy to take any question you guys might have. All right, thank you so much, Melanie. Uh, any any questions, and particularly if there are questions from the students? Yeah, please. Yeah, Yan Ling. No, 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 sorry, sorry to interrupt. Like, just for the sake of the people who are oh, connecting I'm through sorry, Zoom, like, if you can like, yeah, just, no, no. Uh, and if you sorry. wouldn't mind repeating, sorry, I didn't tell yeah. you before. So, if you wouldn't mind repeating the question, sure. uh, just so people on Zoom can, can hear. So, it. the question is Do I have the ASI for some of the moon rocks? And yes, we do have the ASI. And actually, when we picked up composition to do our moon experiment, uh, we also looked at the ASI to like have a wide range of ASI to make sure that we have enough experimental point to explore the whole aluminum possibility on the moon. And that I would like to say, we have sampled what 4% of the moon probably. So we are basing our whole history on about 4% of what we know about the rock on the moon. So that's the best we can do and we have to live with it. But, you know, we have to go back to the moon. <laughs> that would be like the, the end talk to that. So how close are the ASI value? Uh, we don't know because we don't have the experimental calibration to derive proper ASI currently for the moon. All we have is the beta real. And also I wish I could say it's the same as the ASI. I just don't know. And I haven't done that because it's just not good enough for me to think maybe it's the same because it could be different. I would know in maybe two, three months. Ask me again in two, three months. and. Hopefully we have the calibration and I will have real ASI. I can I can skip the nasty thermodynamic part in my talk, which will be nice. Huh? All right, Liam. Uh, so NASA says at least allegedly we're going back to the moon in the next decade. Yeah. So um, based on your results that you've seen so far, have you seen any sort of spatial or depth patterns that uh, when NASA sends you back to the moon that you would like to go hunt for Zircon? Yeah, so the question is, if I can go on the moon, where I would not want to go to find Zircon? That's a great question because NASA, during Apollo's mission, they based their sampling sites on looking at anomalies by remote sensing. So that's why they went in this area that has this very weird composition. And we have been biasing our sampling to basically creep, which is fun because I have Zircon in creep, it's all fine. But I think some part of the moon could have differentiated enough to form some felsic rocks. 
that whole zircon that don't need a creep to crystallize. And on that regard, there is one set on the moon, and we know they are calcifers. We can find sometimes some nodules of like moles of granite and stuff. But I think most of the calcic rocks they are thought to be at the south pole of the moon, south pole Aiken. I mean, this is what people have been kind of uh, seeing and inferring. So I will go there because remember I need zircon, right? So I cannot go in the channel of Gaza. It's not going to be interesting to me. So I'm going to go there. To look for zircon. And actually, there were like a mission called like Moonrise that was supposed to go there you know, with a collaborator, but it got rejected just the last stage. Three mission and some bullshit asteroid. I shouldn't say that now because I guess I was on that stuff uh, for a while. <laughs> but before that, it was like, no, we don't care if you go on that thing. Anyway, and it didn't get funded. That said, I think it's uh, Artemis will be my point to go visit there, hopefully. The other place I would go, nothing to do with Zircon. I like to go on the far side of the moon, on the equatorial, because the far side is completely different than the near side. And I think we need to understand why. Even if there is no Zircon, I want sample from that area to know if the whole model of the linear magma ocean that we have holds. So that whole model was made on that area, that area, that area. And the other side is completely different. And we need to go on the other side. To understand why it is different. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Um, hey, I really love your talk. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I had one question. Why were the younger zircons uh, have a higher uh, temperature based on the titanium? The magmas were at high. Oh, sorry. Uh, why did the younger zircon have a higher temperature? That was just the temperature of the magma they come from. So whatever magma was created by this, um, you know, 3.9 impact was hotter than maybe it was less calcic than the 4.2. I don't know. That's a good point. Uh, maybe they were actually slightly different composition. They were hotter. They were maybe not as differentiated. Uh, the creep was supposed to be pretty low in temperature, so maybe they were not having that much of the creep signature and the mantle temperature was dominating. I mean, the good thing on the moon is because it's dry, the zircon saturation occurs at higher temperature because of the essence of water. So even at high temperature, we can still crystallize zircon. I don't know. I would assume it's a compositional thing. You know, obviously we remove much more of the mantle for the this one that the one that was you know involving the crust. Could be just that is actually hot of magmas. There is still a lot that we have to discover, but now we have a way to probe it, right? That we didn't have you before. Do you think that would be something to do with the decay of the reproduction? No, not. I mean, I calculated it. I mean, uh, there is still much less uranium and thorium in those guys than in like the older zircon that we're having that very strong crit signature. And I did this calculation, and actually, they were not showing higher temperature, even if they had like 100 ppm more uranium. Don't forget, the zircon, they don't have a lot of uranium and thorium. And I don't know what it means for actually the composite. I don't think so, honestly. But again, you know, I am just basing my on a couple of zircon grains. So maybe, but I don't think so. Thank you. Yes, I think you're right. So the question is, why do we have more magma diversity pre 4.2? You're right. It was probably much more active in terms of uh, impact. And now we know that, I mean, you don't know, but I know that at 4.3, it was not a single big one, but it was a lot of big ones. It could be that just the diversity is just because you have all these different magma created. Some of them managed to still preserve the crit primitive signature. So, yes, there is definitely that. But this is interesting by itself because it means that the heat producer elements were also distributed differently in the early linear crust. So who knows how that affected actually the, the early story of the moon as well. That's something I'm not quite clear yet about how that will change. But yes, more impacts will translate into more magma diversity. That's what I guess. And all of those two 
the AS, no, the, the AS doesn't depend on the, the water content. It's just the experiment that Justin did. Uh, he actually saturated with the with magma in water, and we don't know the uh, effect on water on the substitution. So that's why we cannot use this calibration to derive the ASI. It's just because we don't know if that calibration holds when the magma is dry or when it's uh, actually not dry. Because it involves hydrogen as one of the, the substitution guys, I feel like water could make a difference. That's why we are not calculating any more size before we are doing it again. Yeah. Well, I mean, we don't exactly know how much water there was on the moon. That's something that the old group is doing. And we cannot all agree except a couple of oddball i guess that the moon was mostly dry but it doesn't mean that some magmatic composition on the moon couldn't get to like you know 0.5 to one weight person water and this is plenty of hydrogen available from a substitution so i'm not saying that you need to have 10 weight person water we don't have that on the moon the best proof of that are zircon they don't have a cerium anomaly Okay, so the theory and anomaly in Zircon show you like the oxidation state and those are completely flat. So no serum for flat, only three flat, which means dry. That said, a serum anomaly doesn't pick up before you get at least one to person water. So yeah, if you had 0.5, and you know, I think on the moon it's not that hard to imagine. We have evidence of that. We have plenty of oxygen for that um, for that substitution to happen. Uh, sorry, enough hydrogen for the effect. Anyway. To happen, and uh, I am not talking about ocean on the moon. I, I'm just saying that because sometimes when I say that, people then say like the take home message is like there is an ocean on the moon with beaches and stuff, you know, like no, it's not like a like it's not a holiday resort with beautiful ocean and stuff. I'm talking about very little water that's enough to do the job. I think it's possible that you end up with one water in the last. Right. Uh, and you know, remember the zircon they crystallize at the, the end of the residual melt, which means water acts as an incompressible because no minerals are going to take water. We don't have hydrous mineral on the moon. So the water can concentrate pretty, even if you start with nearly nothing, when you crystallize the whole magma ocean, this nearly nothing becomes something. That's because you concentrate it in a very narrow, you know, volume of liquid. Uh, yeah, you, you had a question, yeah. and then we'll go to uh, Irving. So, I guess, like, this is sort of more of a follow up to my question. Um, so, the ASI, you know, the calibration is amazing, and I have a technical question with respect to that. But then, uh, I think, like, this idea of like celtic magmas needed for zircon saturation, maybe like this concept needs to be revisited in some way. Well, not for Earth, but for the moon, I guess. Right, yeah, right. we don't know. Because as we were discussing, like, on the moon, mm -hmm. you have like you know, like 50 rate percent silica, but then just because you have like so much titanium and iron in the system, you can still make a more saturated magma from that. So yeah. It is possible to be just like saturate zircon. Yeah, zircon yeah. saturation experiment had been yeah. done for Earth's uh, system. Uh, it has yeah. been done for like moon composition. So I agree. That's why I wasn't using it really to say that it was silicon enriched, just saying that we have difference in ASI. Yeah. Well, like after a Yeah, just for the sake of uh, giving a shout out to one of our postdocs. So that calibration was actually done by Yan Lin, which is yep. pretty bad. Yeah, this uh, is uh, so she did all the experiments. This is uh, amazing. Sorry, guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, yeah, no, we uh, we did some. Um, first of all, we look at phases. We look at the breakdown of uh, zirconia and silicon, and we don't find zirconia, and we find very rarely badaliite as well. So that allows us to put us at least above about 0.5 for the silica, and we know that most of the time. Actually, maybe I have an extra slide on. Is that this one? Is it this one? Is that this one? Yeah. So. Uh, for the silicon, uh, 
we got an APS victory and we look at this relationship and because we don't have that and we know that it takes about an activity of 45 in order to have that break time we know we are, we are about that so now we also know that every now and then on in our ops we could find quartz but it's it's impossible to say if we're going to or not because of the brescia so we treated it as basically point like 0.45 to 1 for the activity of uh, silicon. For the uh, uh, titanium, there are no repairs. There is a repair at the end of the chain at the on mineral rocks. So we actually took down at the break of the milmenite into iron. And we know this happened because we actually have iron metal on the moon and we have tons of milmenite. And when you look at that actually breakdown, and we do a little bit of thermodynamics, we see that the activity of titanium is actually entering into the equilibrium constant calculation. Mm -hmm. And actually, we have the equilibrium of iron metal on the moon, so we are able to actually constrain using also the fugacity that you can assume on the moon. And I think you can uh, pick up like that. I mean, minus one, yes, I mean, minus one. I mean, you can change a tiny bit. And we were able to basically constrain it a bit in ranging between that and that uh, sample. And then when you actually combine the two, uh, actually they kind of compensate each other. If you have like, if you overestimate your activity and underestimate the other, then they cancel. So what we did is we just treat them as 0.5 in the middle of the range. And we calculated that that will change the temperature for about 70 degrees, if we are like taking the worst estimation we could obtain, and this is the other thing that we reported for our current temperatures. So they are bigger, like usually people report uh, uncertainties on titanium zircon at 30 degrees, but they have better constraints. Uh, actually, not always, but they pretend they have better constraint of the activity because that's the best we could do. They actually were honest and said, okay, it's, you know, 1500 or like whatever it was, 1200 plus minus 70. And that's the best we can do. That's great because I was just wondering if you use basic rule of the calculation. That's the only way. Yeah. Because some people, you know, they use these like belts. Supplemental oh, belts forget belts about it. Sense, but but those were made for Earth composition. Yeah. And I was like, what do you want to do? Even for I and no, I mean, don't talk about milk realizing and all these things. They have very strong, it's a useful tool, but overused. Yeah. No, I mean, if you understand some of the dynamics, it's really not that hard. You know, it's it's just what is happening in the mind. Yeah. Are there any questions? Yeah. I took us a little bit of time. So I'm doing, I'm, I'm playing with the same thing on that side right now. This is easy. But all my samples have like a silica polymorph, like quartz to a crystallize and pentolizite. Every one of my zircon, there is a quartz somewhere, is a sample. So this one, it's a little bit harder. And right now I'm trying to find constraints on that. It's not that easy, but hopefully at some point I will be able to get, right now the temperature I can get down more than 100 degrees and certain feet because I still have a tiny bit of like range for activity titanium. There is not much work that has been done on HEDs. <laughs> uh, VESTA is lower. I mean, uh, in other age, uh, it's about 900. And I don't know why right now. I uh, actually, I got the titanium, my first titanium data last week. So, I mean, I haven't really sold that much, but they are seemingly lower. And um, in the impact, the one that were impact affected, they are even lower. And it's weird because some of these samples are associated with crystal bars. So, you know, the whole impact and each release is actually like something that do like that and then go down. I think the zircon capture some point of that and the crystal like another point of that and the coarse gradient of texture another point of that. So it's not only, uh, not everything is recording the impact release of pressure and temperature at the same time. And I think the zircon data could be a game changer here because before that it was like, we have a crystal light and we have coarse you know, shock melt. Let's call it 1500 degrees. I'm like, okay, but you know, may I share maybe for one second, but then what? 
All right, so before we uh, thank Melanie one more time, I just want to make a quick announcement. And uh, for those of you that don't know, this uh, the, the College of Science lecture series this year is about uh, minerals and about a bunch of faculty from our department are going to be giving talks. And that uh, lecture series is kicking off tonight. Uh, that's going to be at Centennial Hall. There's going to be a, you know, there's a reception right before the talk. And the talk begins at, at 7 p.m. And Bob Downs is going to be talking about Minerals through, you know, like the solar system, the evolution of the solar system and, and Earth, and it's a, it's a super cool talk. So I would encourage you to to go and, and check that out. Um, and so, yeah, so let's thank uh, Melanie again for a great. Talk. <laughs>